Welcome Internet to the Psychologist Casual Review, and today we're going to be reviewing The Capacity to Be Alone by Winnicott. So it's quite a major text, even though it's very short, because in this text he's going to talk about a state of humanness that is being alone, and what that entails and what it implicates. So for him to be alone, to be able to be alone, without resorting to subterfuge or putting your attention onto something else, but really the ability of experiencing aloneness is a more core fundamental aspect of our minds, of our psyches, and quite a mature process. So what does he mean through that it's a mature process? Well, first and foremost, it's because as infants, life starts with the care of the mother. The care is always there. At the start, the infant can't differentiate between mother and self. And throughout life, the child is going to be able to differentiate. But even better than that, he's going to be able to build an inner world, an inner world of good objects. For Winnicott, that building is based on the good enough mother, meaning that mother is not always there, but she's there when she needs to be. She can help the child, but also allow the child to be able to deal with frustrations. That ability to deal with frustrations is going to create something very special in the mind of the child, of a good mother that's there. And that is going to be all that internalized world of good objects is going to be the fundamental basic of why the child can stand to be alone. He can stand to be alone because he knows he has good internal objects. And he said, and Winkock points out very well and very accurately that if there is persecution, if there is suspicion, if there is hate, then it's not, you can't really be alone because even if you're technically alone, you don't have the capacity to be alone because in your mind, your mind is always racing against uh, an object that might hurt you, like in, for example, paranoid states. So fundamentally, the capacity to be alone uh, implies fundamentally a sereneness within the mind, a sereneness can, that can only be there once we have built a true connection to someone else, because that connection has been ingrained into us strongly enough for us to be able to carry it around everywhere we go in a very interesting light and manner. So what I found very interesting is that Winnicott does give examples of that capacity. That for him, for example, when a patient that leaves a silence or does not talk or just enjoys the moment, that is the capacity to be alone. It's a fundamental enjoyment of the moment, but with someone else. That's also something that's very interesting. It's like, it's being alone, yes, but also being alone with another person. He gives another interesting example of this, in the fact that after a sexual relationship with someone, that you feel content, content, happy, joyful, and at that moment you lie with someone else and you just happy and alone in your thoughts, a magical moment in which fundamentally you are alone, but in a way alone with someone else, within your mind. So very interesting stuff. He also speaks about something that I found of high interest in this article of ego relatedness, because it's through care, through love, that the mother is going to create ego relatedness with the infant. That ego relatedness is going to be something very important for the development as it will allow the infant to be able to build an ego that's strong enough not to be destabilized by the drives or the id impulses. Whereas if it's not built in a sufficient way, what happens is that the child will be overwhelmed by the um, impulses of the id which is going to weaken the ego. So he doesn't give examples, but for example, we can think that um, the ability to be alone in and of itself is a tolerance also in a fundamental way to the calm and the passivity of a situation. Whereas if there is no ego, relate, 
in your relatedness. There is too much stimuli that's always there and it always pushes the individual to do something, to be active or to be reactive to something. Whereas the, when the ego relatedness is strong enough, then you can enjoy um, a moment of calm, of just contemplation even on what is happening. And the drives are not going to destabilize those moments because the ego is strong enough to be able to integrate them and even merge with them to create something in which there is going to be happiness and content and joy and fulfillment. Whereas if the ego is not strong enough, the drives are going to hurt it in a way that the, the ego is going to have to act upon the drives or fulfill the drives or prevent the drives from having any impact. So it's going to be very different in both situations. And it's something that I found very interesting throughout the article, how he presents it, the ability to be alone, as something that's so very fundamental. It's even more fundamental than a relationship with someone else, with another human. It's the relationship of us to ourselves. But that relationship of us to ourselves is there because it has, as a basis, all the happy relationships we had with our caregivers, and afterwards with society. But that's what allows us to remain alone with ourselves and alone in the presence of others in a way that makes us satisfied and really answers our needs. Whereas if we don't build that ability, being alone is all feeling persecuted, meaning that you're not really alone because in your mind there's no satisfaction. You just alone because you're afraid and that fear is something that's been widely uh, explored by psychoanalysis on the whole which creates this dynamic in which you, you're not alone you're just afraid and you're afraid and you keep things in your mind and you're not relaxed whereas this ability is relaxation itself you can relax you can enjoy and let yourself in a way, lose yourself into the relaxation that you don't need to hold on to it because it's not going to be destabilized. And even when the id shows itself or manifests itself, the ego isn't destroyed because there was those good moments. So it's a very, very interesting text I felt when reading it that in a way our relationship with others does not just imply interaction, but it implies non-interaction as much. In a way, it's as if it was the other side of the coin, right? You have the interactional side, but you also have the serene side, which is fundamentally important. And I think that Winnicott hit something on, on the head with this, um, with this text, because he does talk about how children, when they play, they sublimate. However, if they have psychological issues, Play is not sublimation, it's not the ability to be alone, it's um, discharge. And when it's discharge, it, there's no symbolization really. It's just that they're not capable of enjoying and creating something. They're just like acting out something. And that acting out is them answering the id rather than transforming it. So yet again, a very, very important point I feel, and I feel that this text has also been very groundbreaking in the fact that um, it shifted psychoanalysis from fears of being alone, isolation, to the positiveness of aloneness, not isolation, but being alone. It's shifted it to something that was much, much more serene, and it's very true that being alone with oneself, with our good internal objects is a fundamental positive for the mind as it allows the mind to just wander and perhaps even free association in a way. It's not necessarily possible when you're always in action, always in movement, which I find that very interesting. So that's pretty much it for, for this article. I hope you liked this video. And if you have any questions, anything you'd like to ask, please feel free to leave them in the comments. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.